Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? <clears throat> Fantastic. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm really glad you're here. Um, I, uh, I just love being in this place. I just think it's a cool place. Um, and I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, y'all hang with us every week because, I don't know, it's kind of weird preaching to an empty room for a while, so almost. Um, but uh, Barbara, good to see you. Glad you're back. Glad everybody's back. Um, make sure we all stay safe. Uh, if you're new to Remnant, I'm just glad you're here. Um, we come here every week and we just try to understand God a little bit more and we try to surrender more of ourselves and we, we just try to um, take whatever the next step is in our journey towards God because we all realize we're not complete without Him. Uh, and um, we've been looking at this book of Jonah uh, which is only four chapters, but we're in week seven, which is about par for the course. Um, but last week, God left Jonah with a burning question. In fact, the book is weird because it ends with a question, and the question's not answered. And the question was essentially asking him, do you care anything about anything or anyone but yourself? That's where God ended the book. Jonah, do you care about anybody other than yourself? Are you worshiping you or me? And I love that there's no answer in this book. I love that the book ends that way. And Jonah is the writer of the book. And he wrote that there's essentially a question at the end. Now, we know because he wrote this book years after uh, these experiences that he did eventually learn his lesson that God did pull the racism and the prejudice out of his heart. Because Jonah learned that there's no place for hatred or racism in the heart of a follower of Jesus. You see, God, remember at the beginning, I said God specifically chose Jonah to go to Nineveh because he wanted to clean out Jonah's heart and make him deal with what he'd been ignoring. It wasn't a coincidence that Jonah was chosen to deliver this message to the Ninevites. And the reason is, God said, look, you can't be my follower and keep this hate in your heart. We're going to deal with this. And Jonah learned the lesson because God determined he had to learn it, but he had to go through desperation to get there. God had already decided Jonah was going to learn this lesson. Just like he's already decided you and I are going to learn this lesson. He's already decided because he's transforming us to be like Jesus. And Jesus can't have racism. Jesus can't have hatred for other people. We're being transformed. So if that's in us, he's going to rip it out of us. Jonah chose to go to desperation first, though. And we saw that Jonah eventually did learn his lesson, but it was some time after the revival that occurred in Nineveh. And Jonah wrote this book in a very honest and raw way so that we wouldn't have to learn the lesson the way he learned it. So we need to pause this week and make sure the story of Jonah is hardwired into our spirit. We need to remember the lessons that we've learned. God loves everybody and we don't. God lovingly pursues those who run from him. We're all connected and our actions impact each other. When we run from God, we take people with us. And they're impacted by the storm that is us. God will take us to desperation if needed to bring us to transformation. Salvation belongs to God and God alone. Only God can bring revival. You cannot truly love God and hate anyone, not long term. There's no place in God's family for those who sit on the hills judging others who don't even yet know God. If you're a true follower of Jesus, God will transform you and he will clean out anything in your heart that doesn't align with his. God's the one that sets the lesson. God makes sure you learn them. For true believers, it's not optional. It's called life, and it's called life in the Spirit. People who know Jesus have the Spirit of God in them, and the Spirit leads you every day, and the Spirit guides you and 
teaches all things. The book of Jonah is definitely not a children's book. The miracle in Jonah is not the fish. The miracle in Jonah is that God brought revival to a whole lot of people who were so far from him, nobody thought they were salvageable. And he did it by the thousands. Why? Because God at his essence is love. Not just that he loves, He is love. It's his essence. So let's take a look today at what John wrote in one of his later years. John was eventually known as the disciple of love because he writes so eloquently about his love for Christ. He didn't start out that way. Jesus originally called him a son of thunder, suggesting that he was bold and that he was Not like Peter bold, but more just eager to, you could amp him up quickly. He's a son of thunder. But after Jesus got a hold of him for a while, all of a sudden now he's a disciple of love. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, meaning he's writing to believers. Let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son in the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. means he paid it all. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us because he's given us of his spirit. So we've come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he cannot love God whom he hasn't seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. What John is trying to help us understand is essentially this. God is love. The Holy Spirit is love. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can't help but love other people. You can't. You might be angry at them for a while, but there's a part of you that says, you know what? You can't stay here. And God says, I'll take you to desperation if you want, but you can't hold hate in your heart and have room for the spirit of love that I put in you. You may be growing in that area, but deep inside, you must be developing a love for others. It is the key, one of the key things that is a sign of spiritual maturity and growth. As you spend time in the Word, as you spend time with God, you can't help but begin to love other people more. It's not that we choose to love others. See, this is something people don't understand. It's not that you become a Christian and then you decide, okay, i got to love everybody, so I'm going to go do that. Loving others becomes part of your existence as a born-again believer. It's part of who you are because you're no longer of your flesh. You're of the Spirit, and God's Spirit loves everybody. It becomes part of your new existence. There's no place for hatred in the essence of God. More simply, God will not allow you, if the Spirit is living in you, God will not allow you to hate His creation. God is love, and believers have been immersed in that Spirit of love. John is telling us we can't have hate If we're true believers, hate for others in the presence of God cannot coexist. God made it very clear here. If you love God, if the Spirit of God is in you, if you've been reborn in the Spirit, 
you can't truly hate other people. You simply can't. Why? Because God is love. The presence of God demands love. Not an obedience issue, an essence issue. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The word must in this passage is a qualifier, not a determiner. Tell you what that means. There's no choice in this command. It's not a command searching for obedience. It's a command of recognition. What I mean by that is it's not saying... The commandment we have, whoever loves God must also love his brother. He's not saying, you go love your brother. What he's saying is, if you love God, you have to love your brother because the essence of him is in you. Not something you're choosing to do. It's a a manifestation of who you are. Does that make sense? You can't choose to love somebody. It's impossible. But if the Spirit of God is the one doing the choosing... You can't help but love people. That's the way it works. He's not saying if you love God, you must choose to love your brother. What he's saying is if the love of God coexists with the love of your brother, the two go together. You can't have one without the other. You don't choose to do it. You must do it as part of your new nature. If you can't begin to develop love for other people, You need to spend time figuring out where the Spirit of God is in your life because He can't not love other people. So God is love. And His Spirit is in you and in me and in everybody who truly believes. You're growing in His love. Therefore, there's never a place in your heart for true hate of other people. I don't care what they think politically. I don't care what they... You cannot hate people and then claim to love Jesus. He won't let you do it. Remember, he went to Nineveh and loved those people. He went to your darkness in your place and loved you. You may embrace what you think is hate for a short time, but it can't coexist long term as part of who you are. You have to let it go. If you're truly in Christ, hate for other people can't be in you. Now, we know from the book of Jonah that Jonah eventually learned this lesson the hard way. It's important to recognize, though, that we're very different from Jonah. We don't think about this a lot, but it's critical when you read the Old Testament. Jonah, as a prophet of God, was at times empowered with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, The Holy Spirit, remember, left when sin left, but periodically God would empower people. He would place His Spirit on people for a task or a purpose. In the time prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit of God was placed on someone to empower them to do what God called them to do. It was called an anointing. We saw at times that King Saul would at times be empowered with God's Spirit, and then it would be taken from him. So it's easy for us to look at Jonah and wonder why he didn't love the Assyrians. Or at least as a people, or at least the children, or at least their pets. Jonah hated them. And he's a prophet of God. But in many ways, I think God was more patient with those in the Old Testament. Because he knew they were operating without the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Let me repeat that. People in the Old Testament were operating their lives without the power of the Holy Spirit in them. That makes them very different than us. Sometimes we forget that when we read the Old Testament and we start judging their behavior. They didn't have the Spirit of God in them. They didn't have the Helper Spirit to teach them all things. They were operating every time, almost every time, in the flesh, unless God put his spirit on them for the moment. The Assyrians, all the pagans, all the Jews, almost everyone other than the select few who were given that power were operating in the flesh. 
And in the flesh, nothing moves you to want to do what God wants you to do. Remember, we are born enemies of God. Nothing in us makes us want to follow God. They could never, even on their best day, share the love of God with other people because they didn't have it. Don't misunderstand. They loved God. And as fallen human beings, to the best they knew how, they tried to love other people, but what they didn't have that they could give away is the actual love of God. The supernatural love that comes from the throne in heaven that is supposed to flow through us to other people. That, that power they didn't have. Every one of them was a slave to sin. Born to worship Satan. Naturally inclined to resist God. Remember, we don't become sinners. We are born enemies of God. We are born that way. Now remember, those who lived in the Old Testament times had almost never actually seen the love of God. They, they didn't see people that had the spirit in them. They never felt the love of God flow through somebody else to them because nobody had it. That's why it was so dark. That's why they were so desperate for a Messiah. They had not seen the love of God on the planet since Adam and Eve left. They loved God, but they didn't have an understanding of his love. In other words, they spent their time trying to worship up instead of trying to receive down. Does that make sense? The world had not seen God's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forbearance, and self-control in almost anyone. They didn't see it. The whole idea of selfless, unconditional love was foreign to them because it didn't exist on the planet. In fact, it couldn't exist on the planet because the planet was under the same curse that man was under due to sin. If God's love, the supernatural love of God that is God, was ever going to be manifested in his creation again, like the days before Adam and Eve's fall, then it would have to come from heaven to earth because we didn't have it. And when we read the Old Testament, we have to remember these were people who operated separate of the Spirit of God. They haven't even seen it, most of them. They were trying to figure out a way to work their way towards God. They were trying to figure out a way to connect to God because they knew they needed to connect, but they didn't have a Messiah to bring them the Spirit. So to the best of their ability, they followed the rules. That They tried to follow the laws because they thought that would bring them into the relationship with God that they wanted. That's why when Jesus came, he said, no, no, I bring you a new commandment. I'm going to bring you the Spirit. Everything's changing. It's one of the reasons Jesus was so radical. He stepped into a world that had not seen God. And he showed people how to live in a way that the world had never seen before. He came to show us God, and God is love. What did Jesus possess that was so unique, so inviting, so transforming? The unconditional love of God. Poured out on other people who'd never experienced it. People who were around Jesus felt a love they'd never felt before. They saw in him something they'd never seen before. That's why he was so radical. They had never seen anything like him. We forget just how dark the days were when Jesus stepped in with the Spirit of God. Jesus showed the world what God's love is really like. His message was not that we should choose to love God in a human way. His message was that we should allow God to immerse us in his love in a supernatural way. Jesus didn't say that he came to earth to teach us how to love God and to love others humans as humans love. Our love is conditional. We don't know anything other than conditional love. We've never seen unconditional love before. We don't and will never have unconditional love as long as we're born of the flesh. 
So that's why John writes this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, Jesus says, you're to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have a love for other people. In other words, I'm bringing you a new commandment. What you think is love is not love. I'm going to teach you to love everybody. It's going to become an essence of who you are. And people will know that you're my disciples because you're pouring out the same love I'm pouring out. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. These things I command, why? So you will love one another. You see, the whole message of God coming to earth was to teach us, give us unconditional love that we pour out on other people. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world cannot stand people who love unconditionally. It makes no sense to them. But now I'm coming to you. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus is coming to the crucifixion. He stops and he prays. And he prays for the people that are there. He prays for the people, the Jewish people who've rejected him. He prays for the Gentiles who are receiving him and he prays for us. And in the midst of that prayer, he stops on his way to Jerusalem and he says this, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. In other words, if God's love is going to be manifested on this planet in this creation, God's people have to stay here and do it. For us to stay here and not share the love of God with other people is a waste of our life. An absolute wasted potential. You and I have been given an enormous gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit that no one in the Old Testament had. And if you think we can sit by as believers and hold that to ourselves, you're out of your mind, literally. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. You've been reborn. You're a heavenly creature having a human experience. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Do you feel sent? Do you wake up every day thinking, I've got the love of God. I've got to go out in the world and give it to somebody. And he'll fill me up again and I'll go do it again. So Jesus teaches us those who truly follow him, those who are truly born of his spirit, can't continually hate other people. Because God's love. And we have the love of God guiding us. Not our love, his love. Jesus brought a new kind of love to the world that no one had seen. It was radical. It was incredible. And it was transformational. People just saw him and saw the love he had for them. And he said, follow me. And they followed. Or they fell on the ground. We can't fully appreciate how unique this was because we've grown up in a world where a lot of people possess and have the spirit of God and the love of God. And we felt the love of God poured out to us through people. They never experienced that before. In fact, most of us are probably here in this room right now because at some point in our lives, God put somebody in our life to pour the love of God onto us. In the Old Testament, that never happened. Well, until Jesus came and brought God's love back and eventually the Spirit of God back and eventually the love of God to the earth. That's why he tells us in this passage, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how they're going to know. 
And Jesus says, I bring you shalom. The peace of God and peace with God. Not your peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let them not be afraid. Jesus does not give as the world gives. There's no conditions. There's no strings. There's nothing in this world that Jesus offers to us. Jesus didn't come down to the planet and say, hey, I got a great idea. I'm going to show you how to really appreciate all the things that are here. I'm going to teach you how to invest wisely. I'm going to teach you how to stockpile resources for yourself. I'm going to come down and teach you how to live in this fallen world better. He didn't say that. There's nothing in this world that Jesus offers to us. Not a thing. In fact, Jesus warns us to seek from him only the things that come from heaven. He warns us, not tells us, warns us. Seek what comes from heaven. It's the only thing important. I came from heaven. My love came from heaven. My peace, my joy, my patience, my kindness, my goodness all came from heaven. Focus on what's coming from heaven. Don't hold on to things that are here. This isn't your home. We're not to seek God so we can get earthly things. Please hear this. Nothing in this world has any value compared to what Jesus brings to you and me straight from the throne of God in heaven. Even your life, your temporary life on earth has no value compared to the gift that Jesus brings from the throne, the gift of eternity. Matthew 16, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? If your life doesn't matter, then anything you accumulate in your life doesn't matter either. The only thing of value that you take with you to heaven is your love of God and the relationships that you have with those who are in Christ. Think about that for a minute. When this is all done, the only thing we take with us is our relationship with each other and our love of God. That should tell us where we're supposed to be investing our energies. Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. There's a qualifier in that verse in the Greek that basically says, if you go on loving the world constantly, the love of God is not in you. He won't allow it. Try it. He'll take you to desperation. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world's passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Remember we said that it's hard for us to remember, but we're actually going to watch everything burn up. That we outlive creation. That we will outlive Mars and Saturn and the universe. And the scriptures are very clear that we're eternal and this world is not. So let's go back to our original passage today. And I want us now to read it with fresh eyes. Beloved, Let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God's love. In this the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only Son in the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. And we've seen and we testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. 
God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected within us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he can't see. How's he going to love God who he's not seen? And the commandment we have for him, whoever loves God must love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Pause here. Not that we decide to keep his commandments. If we love God, and if his spirit is in us, we can't help but obey his commandments. Because if the spirit is leading, the spirit which is God in us is not going to turn against what God wants. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is it that has overcome the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We're not to be in this world. We've overcome it. This world offers us nothing. We've been gifted from the throne in heaven to live this life differently than every other person who doesn't know God. Notice the particular verse 3. For, the love, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Why are his commandments not burdensome? Because when we're empowered with the Holy Spirit, obeying God comes as naturally to us as sinning did when we were empowered in the flesh. It's what we want to do. It's not something we have to do. It's almost like we find ourselves obeying God because we just obey God. His commandments are only burdensome when we try to obey them without the power of the Spirit in us. When you're trying to work your way towards God by obeying His commandments, you will fail. When you're already connected to God, you find yourself obeying His commandments and never failing. Almost never failing. Romans, Paul says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, it can't. Think about what he's saying here. The only way you can obey God's law is to have God in you doing it for you. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And I wish he'd have added, so stop trying. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of righteousness. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And then he goes on. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? How can it happen? It can't. You've been reborn with the Spirit of God. The love of God is in you. Nobody can separate you from that. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of this creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because he's in us. He's as part, much a part of you. You've been reborn in the Spirit. Nobody can take you out of your spiritual being. The world can't do it. Nobody can do it. 
Note the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus manifests the love of God. His Spirit lives in us. It's not that we're choosing to obediently love God. The love of God is in us, and it's just being expressed. That's why it pours out to other people. Matthew says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the laws and the prophets. In other words, if you're going to focus on anything while you're having this human experience until you go home, focus on love. The love of God and the love of people. Born in the flesh, the only thing we know how to focus on is to love ourselves. We may not always like ourselves, but we always love ourselves. We take care of our needs first. We look at the world based on what's happening to us. We care first and foremost about ourselves. Our love, even for ourselves, is conditional. There are times when we hate who we are, but we never stop doing what we think is best for us. Deep down at our core, what we do in the flesh is always what we think is best for us first, no matter what happens to somebody else. In the flesh, we are self-preservation people. My needs need to be met first, and then I'll worry about everybody else. Even something like suicide is a selfish choice. Deciding to go to a place that's better than the one we're in, doing what we think is truly best for us in that moment. It is a selfish choice. But Jesus says there's two commandments. The greatest commandments. And by the way, I never gave you these commandments in the Old Testament because you could never fulfill them. Why is this a new commandment I give to you? Because prior to me being here in the Old Testament, I could give you the commandment, but without the Spirit of God, you could never obey it. How could I ask you to obey something you don't have the power to do? But in the New Testament, where we live, it's a new commandment for us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love other people. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The commandment to love others with the love that comes from the throne of God, a love that Jesus brought back to earth from heaven, he says, I give you now. Because I'm leaving you my love. And when you're full of my love, you can't hate the people I love. You just can't do it. When people see God's supernatural love poured out on them through you, they'll know that you're my disciples. Because you can't be my disciples and not pour out my love. They don't coexist. What does that love look like? It looks like a love that comes straight from heaven. Think about the people that God has called you to love. Just think about them. Maybe the people you haven't loved very well. And God says, well, the problem is you're trying to love them through you. I want you to love them through me. So let me show you the difference between your kind of conditional love and my true love for other people. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When I was a child, we used to sing this song at church around the campfire. They will know we are Christians by our love. Do they? 
When people come to remnant, is it the love of God that overwhelms them or is it judgment? Are we sitting up on the hill full of hate? Are we down with the masses in the dirt celebrating their revival? Jonah had to go through a lot to learn the lesson that God had for him. Remember, God chose him to go to Nineveh because of his lack of love for other people. And I believe that God brings us here for the same reason. Churches that truly love other people are messy places. They just are. Are we the church, the people of Jesus who bear all things, hope all things, endure all things? Are we the people of Jesus who are patient and kind, without envy and boasting and arrogance? Are we the Christians that they will know by our love? When people come onto this campus, do they walk out of that door going, look, I don't know much about what's going on there, but man, those people know how to love. You see, there's no place for hatred or racism in God's family. That's why I said last week, we're not going to allow it here. We're going to love everybody because we can't help it. Sorry. It just happens. We can't stop. We are born again in the Spirit of God. Hate of others we left at the cross and in the tomb with Jesus. When we came out spiritually new, I'm sorry, we can't help but love people. Because it's who we are, not something we're choosing to do. We are all now spiritual beings, full of God's love, showering those with something on people who are desperate for something that's real. May we never forget whose we are. Haters are going to hate. True lovers of Jesus, got to love. We need to know for sure which group we're really in. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for choosing to love us while we were still sinners. Forgive us, God, when we forget that that applies to everybody else too. That there was probably a day when we walked into a church and people sat up on the hill judging us. And maybe all we really needed was just to know that you still love us. God, you are love. Your people have to be about love. Not the kind of love we know that's conditional. If you clean up enough, if you stop doing alcohol, if you stop doing drugs, if you stop cheating on your wife, if you stop doing these things, then we'll love you. No, we're going to love you, and then God's going to make you change. Because when the Spirit of God fills you up, there's no room for those things either. So God, empower us to just be so full of your love that people don't know what to do. That a hurting world sees in our eyes what the world in the first century saw in your eyes. People are just as desperate today for true love as they were when you stepped into the planet. That's why you leave us here. If we're not going to pour out your love, I don't know why we're here. God, help us to walk in the Spirit every day. Help us to go to the places and the people where you want your love poured out. Help us to be lights in the darkness. We love you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for showing us what love really is. Thank you for the lessons of Jonah. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.